Okay, hi. Um, my name is Invar Naor. I'm a data scientist at Tabula. And I want to start this talk with a little question. So let's say you have two models. Both have 90% accuracy, but model A has a 0.91 confidence in each prediction, while model B has a 0.99 confidence in each prediction. So which model would you say is better? So by a show of hands, who thinks that model A is better? OK, and who thinks that model B is better? OK, so I think it was about half an hour or something like that. So I want to argue that model A is better. And the reason for that is that its error self-assessment is better than that of model B. What I mean by that is that model A thinks it's going to be correct about 91% of the time. And indeed, it is correct about 90% of the time. Model B is just overconfident. It, it thinks it's going to be correct about 99% of the time, but it thinks about, but it's correct about 90% of the time. OK? So this is just an intuition uh, to a broader concept called calibration. So calibration is the process of taking a model that is already trained and doing some sort of post-processing in order to improve the probability estimation of that model. And what I mean by improving the probability estimation? What do we want to achieve? So intuitively speaking, we would want that if we take all the samples that got a probability estimation of 0.8 to being belong to the positive class, we would expect about 80% of them to be indeed positive. Right? Does this make sense? OK, cool. Now, we can take this notion and sort of expand it to any value of p, to any um, probability estimation output that the models can give. And we get the following definition. A model is perfectly calibrated if, for any p, a prediction of a class with confidence p is correct 100 times p percent of the time. So this is exactly what we said before, but instead of talking about 8%, we're now talking about any value of p. And mathematically speaking, we can say that we want that the probability of y hat, which is the label that the model gave, and we wanted the probability of y hat given y, the true label. We want this given <laughs> p hat, uh, which, is the, uh, uh, which is the probability estimation. We want all of this to be uh, exactly p. OK, so if a model says p, we would expect that the probability is going to be exactly p. And if we're going to take all uh, possible values of p between the interval of 0 and 1, and we would plot uh, a, a plot of the uh, uh, probability p against the fraction of positives among the samples that got this uh, probability estimation by the model, we would expect to get a perfect diagonal line. OK. So this is calibration. And what I hope to do in this talk is, first of all, I want to um, I want to convince you that, that uh, calibration is an uh, important concept. And if you're not mindful about it, and if you don't uh, look at the calibration of your models, then you should start doing so. And then the rest of the talk is going to be about uh, how to know if the model is calibrated. Next, I'm going to talk about the typical calibration of different models. So we're going to look at different models and see how calibrated they are on, a, on a different data sets. And finally, I'm going to give two simple methods to calibrate the model if your model is not calibrated. So now we can start. First things first, why do, we, why do I say that calibration is, is important? Why do I give this talk? Well, calibration is important only if probabilities are important to you. So if you don't care about probabilities, you shouldn't care about calibration either. If, for instance, you try to build a ranking system and you want this uh, system to, uh, to display items to user by the chances that, that the user is going to click on those items. And you have a model, and the model says that item A has, uh, has an 80% probability of being clicked by the user, while item B has a 70% probability of being clicked by the users. So if we just want to rank the items, we don't really care if item A has exactly 80% probability of being clicked and item B has exactly 70% probability of being clicked, right? 
We only care that item A has a higher probability of being clicked than that of item B. So in that case, we can show item A to the user. So in that case, we don't really care about probabilities to be in the exact probabilities. We just, so, and so we don't really, need, really care about calibration either. So the question now, is become, now becomes not why calibration is an important concept. The question is, when should we care about probabilities? And I'm, I'm going to give a few examples for, uh, for this thing. So the first example is that of high-risk applications. If we try to build, for instance, uh, a model that is going to help a doctor make a decision if a user, is, if a patient is suffering from a specific condition, if it has a specific, if he has a specific disease, or if uh, the the doctor needs to give a specific medicine to the to that uh, patient or not. So in that case, we might want to be interested not in not just in the accuracy of the model, but we might want our model to also be able to say when its confidence are not in its prediction. So in that case, we really care about the probabilities because then the doctor can take this into account when he's making the final decision. So the doctor can say, OK, so the model thinks that the patient has this condition, but it's with very low probabilities, so I need to take this into account. Another example is that of combining a model um, with other probability models. Or, uh, or for instance, if we want to do some sort of thresholding based on the calibration. So if, for instance, uh, let's, take, let's uh, keep the example that we discussed before. If, we're gonna take, uh, if we want um, to send uh, patients to some, uh, some uh, exam that we know that is very expensive. And we know that the insurance company don't really want to send too many peop people to do this exam because it's expensive and they don't want to do that. And the insurance company, for instance, says that only if the patient got uh, above 0.8 probability of a uh, guide above 80% probability of uh, being uh, of uh, suffering from this condition, then we, we want to give him the, the exam. So in that case, we really care about the probability to be inaccurate. We, we, we don't care only about the true or negative class. We care about the, the probability itself because our threshold is based on this probability. Last example is for us as practitioners. So for example, we might want to look at mistakes that our model made with very high probabilities or at true labels, examples that the model got right, but with low probabilities and sort of take a look what, at, at what happens in those, those uh, examples. See what the model did there and what the features were in order to help us de debug the model and improve it. OK? So this is why I think that calibration is important. And a very important uh, point to make is that calibration does not equal accuracy. Now, it might be trivial, but I think it's a very important concept, so I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about it a little bit even though for some of you it might be trivial. We could have a perfectly calibrated model with very low accuracy. For instance, let's say you have a perfectly balanced data set. And your data scientists were super lazy and it just built a ro uh, model and th this model assigns a 50% probability for each, cl uh, for each uh, sample. And it just sort of uh, randomly chooses between the positive and the negative class. So this is a very shitty model, right? It's going to get a 50% probability. Uh, it's going to have a 50% accuracy. But this model is perfectly calibrated. So we have a perfectly calibrated model with very low accuracy. And the other direction is also true. We could have a model with very high accuracy, but bad calibration. So for instance, think about model B that we had at the beginning of, the, of uh, this talk. So model B had a 90% accuracy, which might be true, which might be high given of the application, but it was over overconfident, so its uh, calibration wasn't perfect, even though it had maybe high accuracy. And in fact, sometimes when we calibrate our models, we might even hurt the accuracy. So this is something that we need to take into account. But my point is that we should care both about accuracy and calibration, and sometimes we might even want to make compromises 
in, in terms of accuracy in order to have a better calibrated model. Okay, so now that we talked about all the basic stuff, let's talk about how do we know if our model is calibrated. Now, remember the plot at the beginning of the talk? We had this perfect diagonal line that we want to be as close as possible to, to, to this line. Now, reliability plots does exactly that. It tries to it plot the calibration of the model, and it tries to be as close as possible to that diagonal line. So what reliability plot does is, first, we're going to group all the predictions into bins. And we're going to group them by the probability estimation that the model made. So we're going to take all the samples that got a probability estimation between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, and we're going to put them in the same bin. And then we're going to take all the probability estimations that got, got uh, all the samples that got a probability estimation between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. They're going to be in the same bin, and so on. So we grouped all our predictions into bin. And next, we're going to calculate the fraction of positives per bin. Finally, we're going to calculate the, the average confidence per bin, which is just the average of the probability estimates of the examples that belong to that bin. And we're going to get something that looks like that. So those are typical uh, uh, reliability plots um, for different models. It's on a specific data set, but we're going to see some example later that you see that it's indeed typical, even though for, uh, for now it's just on ba based on uh, one data set. And let's talk a little bit of, uh, about what we see here. So on the x-axis, we have the, uh, the uh, average confidence per bin, and on the y-axis we have the fraction of positives. And let's do, take a look at the calibration plot of support vector machines. So this is the one with the green line. So, for example, let's look at what happens around 0 0.8 confidence. So we can see that all the samples that got something around 0 0.8 probability of being belong to the positive class, about 100% of them belong to the positive class. So we can see that our model is under confidence of, of the prediction it's making next to uh, the, the, for the like, easier samples, for the one that should get 100% uh, probability of being belong to the positive class. And indeed, if we're going to look at the distribution of values of SVM, we're going to see that the probability estimation sort of pushed away from uh, 1. And we're going to see examples for that later. But for now, you might say, OK, I don't want to start plotting everything every time I train a model. What if I want a metric? What if I want a specific number that I can track? So in that case, you might want to look at the expected calibration error, which is just this term that we described earlier, and we wanted this to be as close as possible to be. So we're going to calculate the expected difference between those two terms. And yet again, we can't really calculate this, because p is continuous, and we, ha we only have a finite sample. So we're going to use some sort of approximation, and it's the same approximation that we did with reliability plots. We're going to calculate the difference between the accuracy per, per bin uh, and the confidence per bin, and we're going to do some sort of weighted averages of the, over the bins. Now, if you have a very high risk application, maybe you might want to look at the worst thing that can happen. So in that case, you might want to look at the maximum calibration error not, uh, and not at the expected calibration error. So it's exactly the same thing, but we're going to take the maximum value instead of the expectation. OK, now let's talk about the typical calibration of different models. So this is, uh, this is a work that's been done by researchers from uh, Cornell University. And it's been done about a decade ago, but I think some of it is uh, still relevant. So what they did is they took eight different data sets from different domains, and they trained different models on those data sets in order to see what is the typical calibration behavior of different models. So for instance, let's look at what happens with boosted trees. So on the bottom line, we can see the reliability plot for boosted trees fitted with a sigmoid. And on the upper line, we can see the uh, distribution of, of uh, probability estimation that the model uh, gave. And this is for different data sets. So every column is a data set. And we can see that boosted cheese had this sort of sigmoidal shape that we, uh, that we saw with SVM earlier. 
So yet again, Boosted Cheese also is underconfident of examples that could have gotten a higher score to, uh, to be, uh, belong to the positive class and, and lower score to belong to the negative class. And indeed, we can see that if we're looking at the distribution of uh, predicted values, we see that the, the, the probability estimates sort of pushed away from 0 and 1. And why does this happen? Why do we see like a mass of, uh, of the distribution over here and we barely see values next to 0 and 1? The reason for that is because boosted cheese averages over different models. So what needs to happen in order for boosted cheese to say exactly one, to give an exactly one, uh, a probability estimation of exactly one for a sample? Yeah, we need an agreement between all the models. All the models need to say exactly one. Now, if we're going to add, um, if we're going to add some noise, some of the models are going to give something that is a little lower than one. And in that case, we're going to see that uh, the final value is going to be lower than one. So we kind of see the, the values sort of pushed away from one. And the same thing goes to zero, because in zero, the, error is also, the variance is also one-sided. Now let's look at other models. So boosted cheese is, again, the one, the one we talked about. And we can see the same behavior with SVM. Why does it happen with SVM? The reason that SVM does that is because SVM is a margin method. So it tries to make the margin as large as possible. And this means that, it's, that SVM focuses on the harder, harder examples. So it tries to make the margin, the margin as large as, uh, large as uh, possible, so it might make compromises in terms of his, uh, his confidence in the very easier cases, because it's going to be, it's gonna be OK, I'm, I'm going to be less sure about those easier examples, but I'm still going to classify them uh, right. And then I'm going to gain some, uh, I'm going to uh, gain a larger margin. And this is why we see the same thing with SVM, because the easier examples, that one, the ones that should have gotten probability estimates that are close to zero or close to one, are being compromised and we're, get, we're getting lower confidence uh, for those examples. Now, logistic regression typically have a perfectly calibrated um, uh, plot. And also, they, they, they saw that neural networks uh, tend to have a perfectly calibrated behavior. But uh, in here, it's important to note that this is uh, a work from 2005. So all the techniques that we're using with neural networks nowadays they didn't really check them. And indeed, there was a uh, work that, uh, been done, that uh, was published last year that showed that uh, all the new things that we do with neural networks, like adding a lot of layers and doing dropouts and pretty much everything that we do on a daily basis if we, do, if we use deep learning, all of those things sort of hurt in the calibration of the models. So neural networks are typically not calibrated anymore. OK. So now we know how to check if the model ca is calibrated, and we want to calibrate it. But how do we do that? So the first, things, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take some sort of holdout data set. So it's the same thing that we're going to do if we want to do a model selection or hyperparameter tuning. It's the same technique. So we take some sort of holdout set. And the first uh, method is called plot scaling. And the, the idea is to fit logistic regression on the output of the model. So we're taking all the output of the probability, all the probability estimation of the model, and we fit them to a logistic regression with the true labels being the labels for this model. And now we get calibrated output. So since we don't really need to write any code anymore because there's scikit-learn, it's just importing logistic regression from scikit-learn and fitting it. And this is like the, the amount of Python you're going to need for doing calibration to your model. Now, plot scanning assumes that the, map, the function that maps values from uh, probability estimation to calibrated probability estimations have this sigmoidal shape. What if we don't, don't want to make this assumption? In this case, we might want to use something called isotonic regression. So now we're going to learn, instead of logistic regression, we're going to learn a monotonic piecewise constant function that does the same thing. We transform the, the values to uh, calibrated output. 
So azotonic regression doesn't make the sigmoidal assumption, so it might be better for, for a broader amount of cases, but it comes with a cost of overfitting. Because it doesn't make so many assumptions as plot scaling, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do worse on a very small data set. So if you have small data sets, usually it's more advisable to use plot scaling. OK, so this is everything I wanted to talk about. And the main point of this talk is that calibration is an important concept if you care about probabilities. So if you care about probabilities, you should really stop focusing just on accuracy and also start looking at the calibration of your models. And that's pretty much everything I wanted to say. So we talked about how to look at the calibration using reliability plots, and we talked about different methods for calibration. but. You can all go to go and Google it and find the best method for, method for, uh, for your model. The main idea is that you do so, that you go back from this conference and you start looking the, at the calibration of your models. That's it.